everybody. Thank you, and welcome back to the Miss Infocon track at the International Journalism Festival. We have a full house here in the Sala della Cologne, so I'll go ahead and get started. Our 1030 session is on investigating media manipulation campaigns, and our speakers are Jane Litvinenko, a senior research fellow at the Tech and Social Change Project at the Harvard Shorenstein Center, and Craig Silverman, an investigative reporter at ProPublica. Because we are doing this conference both online and in person, we are actually taking audience questions on a tool called Slido. You can find the information for submitting questions on our website, which is peruja.misinfocon.com, or you can find it on Twitter at Misinfocon. As we go throughout the conference, please feel free to ask questions on Slido. And if you have a question for a particular speaker, please include their name in the question. Also, we encourage you to tweet at us at MissInfoCon at either uh, our Twitter handle, MissInfoCon, or the hashtag, MissInfoCon. It is about 10.30, so I'm going to go ahead and let our speakers take it away. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, weird to not be doing this on Zoom, huh? <laughs> uh, my name is Jane Litvinenko. Um, I'm a senior research fellow with a project called the Tech and Social Change Project, which is led by Dr. Joan Donovan um, at Harvard's Schoenstein Center. Uh, this is my uh, colleague, I guess former colleague, uh, yes. <laughs> My colleague, Craig Silverman. Craig. Hey, everyone. Uh, I work at uh, ProPublica, mostly investigating uh, disinformation, media manipulation, and covering tech platforms. Um, and the way that uh, we're going to approach this uh, session is part of it is going to tell you about our approach to investigating uh, mis and disinformation online. And part of it will give you some practical, hands-on ways to investigate mis- and disinformation. Um, you're also able to ask questions, uh, which Craig will be monitoring live. Um, you can also tell me if, you have some, if I have something stuck in my teeth. Um, that works, too. Um, so you can scan this QR code um, or go to sly.do um, and type in the code 04072. Um, I uh, have another slide with this at the end of the presentation if you suddenly think of something that you want to ask as well. Yeah, I am going to be monitoring that while Jane is, uh, is talking. So if you have a question about something that she's going through at that moment, we could maybe you know get to that at that moment, or we'll just take questions at the end. So by all means, scan the code or go to the site now. It does work on mobile. You can see the questions other people are asking. You can also upvote questions. Uh, and so we'll be looking at that and definitely encourage you to use it. And I encourage you to uh, tell some jokes, too. If you don't have a question, you can tell us a joke. <laughs> that works, too. Um, so uh, before we really get into um, how we investigate misinformation, I wanted to tell you a little bit about what our team does. So the vast majority of the research uh, for our team at Harvard li lives on mediamanipulation.org, um, on a website we call the Media Manipulation Casebook. Um, and there's a few different ways that we're approaching our research, and the primary way is through case studies. Um, essentially, we break down media manipulation campaigns, we investigate them digitally and ethnographically um, to answer the question, what happened? Uh, where did a media manipulation campaign come from? How did it begin? Um, who amplified it? What was the media response? And what were the results of that media response? The point of the casebook is to give clear definitions for what we see online. Um, it's a little bit like a living encyclopedia. Um, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to build up a knowledge base of the tactics that we see used in media manipulation campaigns. So you won't see every single fake debunked on our website. Instead, what you'll see is a wide variety of tactics um, used on social media to try to understand what our environment is, what are the vulnerabilities, what are the policy recommendations that can be made on those, uh, based on those vulnerabilities, um, and how we can approach tackling this problem um, in a systematic way. 
We also publish research outside of media manipulation campaigns that seeks to try to understand what goes on on the internet. Uh, with Russia's war on Ukraine, we published a fact sheet uh, just uh, helping frame the conversation around what's going on. Uh, we also published a rapid response research brief on the role of TikTok um, during the war. And we have a timeline that is getting updated weekly um, on social media uh, mitigation, uh, takedowns, and removals around the war in Ukraine. So aside from understanding media manipulation campaigns, mediamanipulation.org uh, is really meant to be a resource for journalists um, and researchers to try to understand uh, media manipulation as it is now. And the vast majority of that is done through what we call a media manipulation life cycle. The media manipulation life cycle is a framework uh, that our team led by Dr. Donovan developed to try to understand the entire ecosystem of media manipulation campaigns online. Um, this ecosystem is really meant to allow us to take a step back and understand uh, how a media manipulation campaign develops. And we use the term media manipulation because not every piece of media manipulation is a disinformation campaign um, or a misinformation campaign. Misinformation being, of course, accidental or non-intentional spread of false information and disinformation being intentional spread of false information. But some manipulation campaigns are neither of those. Some of them are amplification of hashtags um, or um, using social media in ways that are not necessarily organic or genuine, um, but don't fall under the hat of disinformation. Um, and we study that as well. Um, and so what we're gonna be looking at in this session is gonna be rooted in the media manipulation life cycle. Before we dive in, I wanna say that vicarious trauma in online reporting is a very genuine and difficult uh, condition um, and thing to go through. Um, there are many resources during the conference to help understand how uh, reporting impacts our mental health. Particularly with the war on Ukraine, um, there has been a lot of very um, graphic imagery that can impact uh, our mental health. And with any online investigations, that is something that we need to take into consideration proactively and before we start our investigations. Um, and so I wanted to uh, highlight this session, but there's many more at the conference that you can go um, to understand the impact of our journalism on our mental health, which should be taken seriously um, and not frivolously. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna break down the ways a media manipulation campaign works um, into easy steps for online research. I'm also gonna give you guys some hands-on tools um, that uh, will help you particularly with monitoring media manipulation on the social web. Um, and uh, Craig also has a session this afternoon that will help you investigate websites and online digital ads which I strongly encourage you to go through because it will be a beautiful complement to what we're gonna be talking about today. So before we even find a misinformation <coughs> campaign to investigate, we need to monitor the information environment. Um, Twitter is of course the best way to do that because it's the most open social media network uh, that we have access to but we should be really careful with not focusing our research only on Twitter. Um, Twitter advanced search is probably the best tool you have in your back pocket to try to understand the conversation that is happening um, around any breaking news event. Um, advanced search is also available uh, through Google, Yandex, and other search, uh, search engines. Um, I'm not going to touch on those today just because uh, in, the, in the interest of time. But please know that there's a lot of really wonderful tricks you can use um, with Google with advanced search. And the reason why advanced search is so important is because it really expands our capabilities and allows us to either expand or narrow um, the topic that we're looking at. 
It's also an incredibly reliable tool with Twitter, Google, Yandex, and many other search engines. It's built directly into the framework of the website. And so unlike with outside tools, we don't have to worry about whether it goes up um, or down. Um, we don't have to worry about reliability. But please remember that there are limitations, as I've mentioned, with Twitter. Not everything happens on Twitter, no matter how much journalists wish it did. Um, and with Google, of course, Google does not index every single website. Um, and Google specifically has a lot of um, built-in uh, algorithmic medication around disinformation. Um, and so you may not be able to see all of the results um, that you need from a simple search um, or from part of the world where Google is not the primary search engine. To use social, uh, to use advanced search, uh, we need to use advanced search operators. And I promise you, uh, this will feed into the media manipulation life cycle. But um, an advanced search operator is essentially a way to talk directly to the search engine to tell it what it is that we're looking at. Um, and uh, this might seem a little bit distant as I explain these uh, commonly used Twitter operators, but I will show them in practice in a moment as well. Um, the AND search operator means that we uh, search for key terms uh, on both sides of that uh, search operator, so uh, both words on either side of AND. Uh, the OR search operator uh, acts more like a comma. It means we search for either one of these search terms. Um, since and until are pretty self-explanatory. Um, they are a way to give a date range to Twitter um, to uh, tell it which uh, dates we want to be looking at, as one example. Minimum retweets and minimum likes, also pretty self-explanatory. Sometimes you want to weed out the junk, um, and these are really great ways to do that. I'll just note that after the colon, never put a space. It will not work if you put a space. Um, the quotation marks mean you would like to search for that search term um, as it is spelt. Um, this is particularly important with names uh, or locations that are not commonly used. Um, and I will leave the brackets for now because it's easier to see in practice than try to explain it, um, although the best way to explain it is the order of, of operations. Um, just like in algebra, you use brackets for an old order of operations. You use that in advanced search as well. And the dash or the minus sign takes out a key term if it is not useful. And in order to formulate an effective search, we need to think like a manipulator. The words that a person involved in a crisis, a war, or a breaking news event uses are going to be different from the vocabulary of a of a uh, manipulator. So uh, think about what key terms you've already seen, what are synonyms, related words, or misspellings, um, and misspellings is an incredibly important point here. Um, how would you talk about this without using any key terms? What kind of words would you use? What kind of hashtags or images? Are there any words that are not particularly useful to you that should be excluded, that you should be thinking of? Um, is there a date range for the event? And I'll also say avoid using location-based searches, particularly on Twitter. Sometimes they can be useful, but most of the times people no longer tag their tweets with the location of where they're tweeting from. Um, we have evolved past that as a data-conscious society for the most part. Um, and so it will narrow down your search results too much and you just won't get um, as much useful goodies. Um, as you would if you excluded um, uh, location-based searches. So I'm going to walk you through some of these advanced searches. You can follow along on your own for those of you with laptops, but a warning that this will be touching on the war with Ukraine, which means you may unintentionally see graphic images. Um, and so if you're doing these searches along with me, I took great care to make sure that none of those are in our presentation today. Um, but if you're following along on your own laptops, just be mindful that um, you, may be, uh, you may be exposing yourself to some graphic imagery. So um, 
We're going to start easy and then get a little bit more complex. So if this is not news to you, maybe something else will be. Um, but uh, when earlier I said uh, we need to take great care to include spellings and misspellings of certain locations, this is what I mean. So this is just a search for Kiev, Ukraine's capital. And there's a few different search terms uh, here. The first is the Ukrainian transliteration of Kiev, K-Y-I-V. Um, that is the preferred spelling, and that is the spelling that Ukrainians have fought for because in Ukrainian, it's Kiev. Um, but in Russian, it's Kiev, uh, which is spelled as K-I-E-V. Um, and it's very frequently deliberately spelt, spelt that way by Russian manipulators as a way of asserting um, linguistic dominance over Ukraine. And so if we do not search for K-I-E-V, um, we may be missing tweets or posts from uh, pro-Russian manipulators. That also goes for the two words uh, afterwards, Kyiv, uh, the one with the uh, double dotted I is the Ukrainian spelling. If you don't speak Russian or Ukrainian, by the way, this is a great trick to figure out which language you're looking at. Uh, the Russian language does not have the um, I with the two dots, and it also does not have just the letter I. So um, if you're looking at that, it's probably Ukrainian. And the, sec uh, the last word here is the Russian spelling of Kiev. Um, and the reason why it's useful, of course, is because this war is multilingual. Um, and this will return uh, search terms uh, that, uh, that are available to us in three different languages, already expanding your search. And here we're using the OR uh, search operator, meaning Google will return any of these searches if we used and, it would look for tweets with all four of these key terms in the search, which is not particularly useful because we're not going to see a lot of tweets that do that. We can also combine that with more specific terms. And when I said brackets are particularly useful, and one great way to think of them is algebraically, this is what I mean. So in this search, uh, if we're looking at uh, various attacks uh, that we're monitoring on Kiev, uh, we would include that into a separate set of brackets. Because what we're essentially doing here is we're telling Twitter, look for any spelling of Kiev um, and combine that with any of these key terms that I've given you. Um, these are sort of ones that I came up with off the cuff. And please notice that they're all in English. So we will not see tweets from uh, Ukrainian or, uh, English or, or Russian language accounts, most likely, um, unless they use the second set of search terms as a hashtag. Um, if you wanted to expand your search further, um, you could uh, throw these terms into Google Translate and uh, separate them with the OR search operator and expand your search further there. I just decided to not torture you with languages that the vast majority of the room um, probably does not speak. Um, and there's a few different things I would like to point uh, out to you here. Um, the first thing is that, uh, of course, there's many different ways to search on Twitter. In the first instance, the top tweets are algorithmically, uh, algorithmically um, shown to us. Um, and I also wanted to highlight the tweet from Kiev Independent. As you see in the tweet itself, the word Kiev does not appear, but it does in the title and the handle of the publication. I wanted to highlight that because Twitter will search for these key terms in the names and handles of these accounts as well. If we search by latest, uh, that, those tweets are chronological, uh, which I find particularly useful, especially during a breaking news event when things are evolving and happening quickly. Um, here we already see something uh, sketchy that might bear some investigation. You'll see that there's a tweet that was copy and pasted from a much more popular tweet. 
this happens all the time, um, but already I would click on this account and I would say what's going on here, is it trying to gain a reputation, what other uh, sort of uh, content is it posting? Um, and also the photo and video tabs are really useful if you're uh, collecting evidence, uh, particularly visual evidence to try to verify geolocated and put together a timeline of events. Um, so don't forgo the photo and video tabs. We can also expand this search further, um, and I wanted to make sure you understood the power and the importance of the word I. Because if you're a person involved in a disaster, you're not gonna be talking about Jane needs help. You're gonna be saying I need help. And so particularly if you're looking for uh, victims, eyewitnesses, or anybody else who might be helpful to you in your reporting, you can include terms like I, I'm, me, my, or mine. Um, and that will expand your search for you. Um, already using this search, we found two people who, um, who uh, heard a missile in the first case um, or who are in Ukraine in the second case. So if we wanted to talk to people who are on the ground, who are involved with an event, um, this is a particularly uh, important and useful advanced search term on Twitter that we can use. So far so good? All right, I see, I see nods maybe, great. Uh, just, yeah. just one thing quickly to say, so somebody has noted, they're sitting in the back, they're finding it hard to see the slides. Um, I'm gonna drop a link to the slides in the Slido. So uh, if you, you can have access to those slides forever, they're Google Slides, so they're online, but also if you wanna follow along, you'll be able to do that, so make sure you load the Slido uh, again to do that. Um, and I'll just, it's sli.do, and then the code is 04072. So sli do and the code that you enter is 04072 and within a minute or two I'm going to drop a link into the slides that Jane is going through. Sweet. Um, a couple of more uh, Twitter advanced search tricks before we get back to our media manipulation life cycle. Um, oh, unfortunately, well, I hope you can see it in the search. Um, one of the uh, defining characteristics of pro-Russian accounts have been their use of the letter Z as well as the letter V, um, which are now vastly um, associated with Russian atrocities. Um, and uh, where you see are you there after the word and is actually meant to be the Russian flag. Um, you can kind of see it in the Twitter um, search, sorry if it's a little bit small. Um, but I wanted to show this to you because you can search by flags or emojis as well. Um, and in cases where uh, a lot of that is being used around the conversation around uh, the war on Ukraine, it can be really, really useful. So in this case, uh, using the little emoji Z or the letter Z with co the combination of the Russian flag um, can very quickly get us to Russian propaganda, um, basically within two clicks. Um, so in the first case, we see that there's a particularly popular account spreading a false claim around Bucha, the affluent suburb around Kiev that is now associated with the word massacre. Um, we also see uh, many accounts uh, under the latest tab who are using the emoji as well as the letter Z as an identifier of being pro-Russian accounts. And this is the coolest one that I wanted to show you. If you go to the people tab on your Twitter searches, you're able to see a very long list of accounts that uh, use these pro-Russian identifiers. You can then drop those accounts into a spreadsheet and monitor them en masse. You can create a Twitter list out of these accounts and look at what they're promoting. Um, and you can use that as a very quick way to get from not knowing what pro-Russia stances are to seeing media manipulation campaigns. Again, really within two clicks with Google Advanced Twitter search. You can also use this to find pro-Russia Telegram channels. 
t.me is the URL shortener that Telegram channels use uh, to promote, uh, uh, to link to themselves. Um, it's usually t.me and then slash whatever the name of the channel is. So using these identifiers, um, and again where it says are you, it should be a Russian flag, but using these identifiers, as well as t.me, you're gonna be able to find a whole lot of Telegram channels that are spread on Twitter um, that you can then monitor. And I will have a brief set of slides on Telegram for you as well. Last tip uh, before we move on away from Twitter advanced search. And if you have questions about Twitter advanced search, just drop them in now. Much prefer to answer questions as we go than uh, at the end. But uh, you can also use filter verified to see what kind of accounts uh, or tweets are being promoted by verified accounts. Um, you can use Russian embassy in quotes. Um, so searching for specifically the words Russian embassy, as well as filter verified to see all Russian embassy accounts on Twitter. Why is this useful? because Russia has been using its diplomatic powers online and off to spread false information about Ukraine. Um, you can, once again, create a Twitter list out of all of these accounts, download them into a spreadsheet, um, or uh, use them for further research. Um, this is a really great way. Um, you can use this for many, uh, in many different uses. I thought, uh, I thought that the Russian embassy would be um, the most useful one for you. So again, filter verified, very handy. If you're stuck, you're trying to figure out how to use Twitter advanced search in your own work, trying to find creative ways to uh, apply this to your own sphere of study, you can go to tweetdeck.twitter.com, uh, which is a live monitoring Twitter tool. Um, a lot of it is pretty intuitive. If you get stuck, you can always uh, message me and I'll help you. But if you click on the little, uh, on the little settings wheel, um, you will see uh, uh, an option called search tips. Under those search tips, TweetDeck has very usefully collected for you a lot of different really interesting ways you can use advanced search on Twitter um, for your own uses. Um, so if you're ever stuck, if you ever forget these tips, if you ever misplace the handy link to the presentation that uh, Craig just dropped into uh, Slido, um, you can go here um, and they will get you set up. So all of this uh, is really a long-winded way of saying to understand where a media manipulation campaign comes from, we need to monitor media first. Uh, we cannot really go in in the middle of a media manipulation campaign and hope to figure out where it came from. That is going to get increasingly difficult. Um, and attribution is always hard, but if we're doing ongoing monitoring, we're usually able to see where a media manipulation comes from before it really blows up um, and before it becomes viral, before it's promoted by influential figures. Because of the way social media functions, um, we are very rarely able to say, here's the specific person who is responsible for beginning this media manipulation campaign. Um, but context and monitoring can help us understand crucial points of spread. We should also be asking, what do all of these accounts have in common? Um, have they all began tweeting about this at roughly the same time? Have they been tweeting about other things uh, together in tandem? Are there any financial or political interests that we can note? Um, so again, stage one is usually the most difficult um, and it's usually the one that requires the most forensics, online forensics and the most ongoing monitoring. Stage two um, in the life cycle is seeding uh, content across social media. And this is the case that we're gonna be looking at for the rest of the workshop. Um, this is a case, um, the, it's really the, the most, um, or the least graphic case of media manipulation that's associated with the war that I could find, um, which is why we're looking at it. But it's also really interesting. 
um, because it was a case that was seeded across social media channels beginning around uh, March 13th, 14th, and 15th. Um, there's a few interesting things I would like for you to note here. One is the key terms. So uh, the claim is that a Canadian sniper named Wally, the world's deadliest sniper, has been killed. He was killed by Russian special ops sources 20 minutes after going into action in Mariupol in Ukraine. Mariupol, of course, being um, the deeply besieged city uh, in Ukraine's south. Um, this spread all across social media. So the first screenshot that you see on your left, my right, um, is on Telegram. Uh, we saw many influential pro-Russian Telegram channels post it. Um, this is one of them. This one's uh, titled Release the, Croc the Kraken, which anybody from the US will be familiar with that term. And you also see that it has the Z in the title. Um, and again, more on Telegram in just a second, so if you're uh, anxious to get there, give me a moment. Um, it was spread about, uh, around about a dozen influential Telegram channels, um, and uh, we, would, we were able to see that through our monitoring. Um, it also spread on uh, Twitter, um, although not to the same degree, uh, mostly by anonymous accounts and pro-Russia accounts. Um, and I'm not going to go too deep into 4chan, uh, which is an anonymous and very vile messaging board um, that you should avoid going to at all costs unless it's part of your job. Um, but it also spread on 4chan, and that is the last uh, image that you see there. Um, Dale, keep going. I was going to ask you a question when you were done this part. All right. <laughs> I <laughs> uh, saw, you know, uh, you unmute yourself. Um, and so uh, what we're able to glean from this social media seeding is that um, it was largely spread, seeded on social media by pro-Russian accounts. We did not see legitimate accounts of people putting their own name on this hoax. Tell, tell me the question. All right, we got a question. Um, so the question is, do you use any tools or services to monitor your searches automatically? Do you get like generated reports from it, or is this something that you have to look at manually? So this is something that you can look at manually, although I am about to show you a really handy tool called uh, WeVerify, formerly known as Invid. That is uh, basically the holy grail of uh, looking at Twitter data in bulk. Um, but I will say that there's really no tool that will uh, substitute human understanding of what you're looking at. Computers are limited about what they're able to do, and so for a lot of this, you have to read this stuff yourself. You have to understand it yourself, because the benefit of monitoring this uh, manually is not just seeing media manipulation campaigns as they come up, but also understanding the ecosystem, understanding the main players of that ecosystem, and understanding the impact that individual channels or accounts have on the spread of this uh, information. So um, generally, uh, manually is the way to go, um, but I will show you a really fantastic tool, I think literally right now. Uh, just to add one thing on to that monitoring piece is that, so. As Jane said, you want to see the stuff. You don't want a computer doing the analysis and, and eliminating things for you. You want to see all of that. Um, two tools that can help sort of collect it for you is uh, if you have access to CrowdTangle, which is a free tool owned by Facebook slash Meta. Um, if you want to monitor Facebook pages and public Facebook groups and Instagram accounts, all of which are public, you can't monitor any private thing or individual people's accounts, you can set that up to send you alerts if something is like going extra viral. You can also set it up to send you like a daily summary of top performing posts. Um, just a very quick note on that, which is that the Crowd Tangle team uh, within Facebook has been sunset and they're not onboarding new clients. So if your news organization already has access to Crowd Tangle, you can use it. But if you don't, unfortunately, it won't be available to you. Yeah, and so which really sucks. Um, and then the second one is just Google Alerts are uh, super helpful. If you create a search 
if you are consistently looking for you know news and new online content about a person or an entity and you set up a search in Google Alerts, you can have it come to you, you know, daily, weekly as it happens. And then that gets, you know, you into the habit of looking at things. Uh, and again, it's not doing the sort of analyzing for you. You have to look at it, but this way it's coming into your inbox or what have you, and you can, you know, be reminded to take a look at it. And a lot of these advanced search tools that I've shown you on Twitter also work on Google Alerts, so you can use the ands, you can use the ors, um, you can use the minus sign, um, and anything else. So um, that is very handy as well. And set me up beautifully to tell you about my absolutely favorite best tool that there is, which was created by fact checkers for fact checkers. Um, so uh, it, is, uh, it is really one of the best things that we have to monitor Twitter in bulk. Um, I will, you can download, it's a Chrome extension, uh, which you can download uh, at this URL here, weverify.eu forward slash verification plugin. Uh, once you download that, you can um, smash that little logo, click open toolbox, but before we get to that, um, there is a caveat. The caveat is uh, that it is only available to news organizations and researchers um, if you sign up for an account and if you sign up for the advanced uh, tools option. Um, I'll walk you through how to do that quickly because sometimes people get, get a little hiccup on how to do it. Um, once you o download the tool, open the toolbox, you click the login button. Um, and you have to click register. You can't just enter your email and get an access code. You have to click register, and you absolutely must use your professional email address. The reason for that is because there's a lot of potential for bad actors to misuse this tool, and they very carefully vet those who are able to use it. So you must use your professional email address when you sign up for this tool, um, this is human vetted, not computer vetted, and so it might take some time for you to get to it, but it is 100% worth it. Uh, just a quick note, I did drop a link to, uh, to Invid in the Slido, so that's sli.do, and the code is 04072 um, if you want to get access to that. Thanks, Mr. Sullivan. Um, and the reason why it's worth it is because you get access to their Twitter SNA tool once you are registered. And what this tool does is it's essentially a Twitter conversation visualizer. In this case, I, uh, in this case, I uh, dri dropped in three key terms uh, related to our little case. The key terms that I dropped in are sniper, uh, the name of the sniper, Wally, as well as the number 20, because the claim is that he was killed within 20 minutes, um, which is particularly important to us. Again, it's very, uh, very key to understand limitations. Right now, we're searching in English, so anything in Russian or Ukrainian will not come up. Um, and uh, this tool brings in, I believe, 10,000 tweets at once. It sounds right to me. Yeah, 10,000 tweets at once. So you cannot ask it to uh, visualize too big of a conversation in here. So you can't just drop in the word Ukraine and be like, cool, I'm done, uh, because you will be very limited by the amount of data um, that it comes in. This is really useful for targeted searches, not for understanding what is going on on Twitter overall. Um, so in this case, Sniper Wally 20 were key terms. And uh, I gave the date range between March 1st and March 31st, uh, even though I knew that I was seeing it uh, on March 15th, to understand when the conversation spike began. Um, it is, uh, I, I cannot say enough about this tool. Um, please download it and use it. Some of, the best, uh, some of the best features I will walk you through, but not all features. Um, and this is only one of the many tools in the NVIDV Verify tool set, so uh, I will walk you through what we have time for. Um, in this case, the propagation timeline shows us a big spike right after March 13th. Um, we're able to scroll through this um, to better understand which accounts helped, modify, uh, helped amplify this message. 
Um, but we also get a list of accounts uh, that is downloadable for you data nerds in the room. Uh, you can get a CSV of this. Uh, that we can sift by date posted, like number, or retweet number. Uh, we can also click on the little Twitter button um, to, better under, uh, to see the tweet and better understand uh, where it came from. So this is a really great quick way to understand who amplified the message the most or who amplified the message first. Uh, Jane, quick question. Is yes. Invid only uh, available in English? I think yes, unfortunately. Um, but you can, of course, search in any language. Um, although you have to, you have to fact check me on that. Would you mind looking it up real quick before sure. I, as I go on? Yeah. Um, it'll also show you the most retweeted and the most liked users, uh, which again is really useful for bulk data analysis. And it will show you the URLs that uh, these users are amplifying. So you can see, for example, if any news organizations are involved in the media manipulation campaign um, or anything else like that. There's a lot more that it, sh it will show you. These are just the top ones that I find useful, but um, download it, sign up for an account, play around with it, it's fantastic. Uh, just to follow up now, uh, so, and this is a surprise to me, so it's uh -huh. good that we looked at this. So, uh, Invid, when, once you open it, it is available in English, French, Spanish, and Greek, and it's available in Greek, if that seems a bit random, because some of the developers and partners on the project are based in Greece. Um, so those are the languages that are available now, English, French, Spanish, and Greek. Fantastic, look at that. Fact-checking live. <laughs> um, so in this case, we were able to determine that Software News was the primary Twitter account that amplified this, and so as we try to understand how this went viral, um, these are the users that we would be digging in further in our case study. Stage three is responses by politicians, activists, and media. And I want to note here that this does not include mitigation, such as fact checks, uh, which generally come after they've been a after a claim has been amplified. But this is an incredibly important stage. It's an incredibly important stage because when we figure out what to debunk or what not to debunk, what to cover or what not to cover, we don't want to accidentally amplify misinformation or disinformation or a media manipulation campaign that hasn't had a lot of impact, that hasn't had uh, anybody influential really promote it, that kind of lives on its own tiny corner of the web and hasn't, hasn't gotten out of that corner of the web. Um, in this case, the campaign was pretty significant. Um, one of the people who was amplifying it was uh, uh, an official in Kadyrov's cabinet in Chechnya. Um, I posted the Google Translate there for you, um, but he amplified it on his Twitter account, and it's very, very tiny. People in the back might not be able to see, but that message alone was seen by 120,000 people on Telegram, just that one message. It was also amplified by Russian media and some uh, uh, non-reputable news organization accounts. Um, again, most of this we're looking at in English, uh, but, be, but of course, uh, looking at it in Russian and Ukrainian is incredibly important too. What does this tell us? This tells us that at this point, uh, the manipulation campaign has gone out of its small ecosystem um, it has been promoted by officials and therefore deserves our attention and our investigation as journalists. So um, at this point, at stage three, we would have monitored some of the conversation around Ukraine. We would have seen that the accounts that we found on Twitter and Telegram that we're monitoring are amplifying this claim. And we're seeing that there's pickup from officials and news outlets of this claim. This is also the way that we should write our stories to give context to audiences to try to understand where it came from, how we found this, and why it's important. Fact checks are huge. They're in a very important mitigation measure. And it also really pays to explain to our audiences what actually happened on the internet rather than only saying whether something is accurate or inaccurate, um, because the more context we're able to give our audiences, the better they're able to understand the situation. 
Um, and I had saved a question, <clears throat> pardon me, a question that had come in earlier, because it seems to relate to this part of the life cycle, which is, um, so what about media misamplification, which is a part of the life cycle, um, the questioner asked, tracking the explosion of coverage of the bad actor or bad info. So just sort of in terms of, you know, the coverage and looking at that, like how important is that in the life cycle? It's incredibly important. Um, and we very frequently see media legitimize or amplify something that doesn't de deserve amplification, um, essentially um, using what we call trading up the chain tactic. Uh, what happens is uh, media manipulators or bad actors intentionally target media for amplification of their messages. And sometimes it works. Um, sometimes media is responsible for amplification of those messages or misamplification of those messages. And that is why it's so important to understand our role as journalists and as media in the life cycle of the media manipulation campaign because we don't want to do the work for the manipulators for them. Um, and that is also why it's important to do that early monitoring. Anything for, from you to add as uh, the grandfather of disinformation? Grandfather, today? wow, thank you for <laughs> describing how old I am. No, I mean, that's, this is, and this is one of the challenges in newsrooms is that the basics, like a lot of the core stuff that Jane is going through right now, this should be something that every journalist knows whether you consider yourself a disinformation reporter because the danger is that people who are on lots of different beats who don't know these basic things, they get caught up unintentionally spreading something. And what a lot of bad actors do is, they sort of present what they're doing as a very reasonable concern. They are a concerned parent, right? Just asking uh, questions. You know, just asking questions. They are concerned about, you know, the grooming by, you know, of children by pedophiles, which is a legitimate concern, but they're bringing it forward in a way that is rooted in a conspiracy theory, for example. And so if journalists don't, if we fall for that and don't actually understand how to dig into the background of that group and, you know, whether they're actually coming at this from a real concern, then we basically become a recruiting tool for them. Mm -hmm. Um, very quickly, because I've touched on Telegram a couple of times, I know we only have 15 minutes, so this will be a very blazing quick uh, introduction to Telegram. But for anybody who hasn't used it before, it is one of the primary social media networks, both um, in Eastern Europe, in the MENA region, um, in South America, and a lot of other regions in the world. So it's important for us as reporters to understand what it is. Um, there's a few different functions on Telegram. One is a public channel that is closest related to what Twitter looks like, a public feed, just posting. Um, there are group chats, and of course, there are one-on-one -on -one messages as well. Um, we're also seeing uh, news outlets in uh, the West begin to adopt Telegram. So both Washington Post and New York Times are on Telegram as well. Um, in Ukraine, every single official is on Telegram, including from Zelensky to local mayors. Um, all of the um, disaster coordination efforts are happening on Telegram. Um, all news outlets in Ukraine and Russia have Telegram channels. So uh, it's important to understand that although in the Western media context, it is generally seen as a niche tool that is used generally by niche communities, extremist communities, far-right communities. That is not how it's seen by the vast majority of its users. Uh, TGstat.com is a very useful website for discovering channels, and not just discovering channels, but also seeing channel statistics. So here's that Chechen official, and we saw a big spike in his subscriptions. Um, as one example, after February 24th. Um, again, I won't spend too much time on it, but um, tgstat.com, very useful. You can also use some of the search operators that we already talked about on Google to discover Telegram channels. So the site search operator essentially says, search this website. t.me is the URL shortener, as we have already talked about, that is used to promote Telegram channels. And so searching for site colon t dot me Ukraine will get, or any other key term that you think would be useful, will get you a long list of Telegram channels. Um, and you can use Telegram itself. 
Telegram has a fantastic global search tool. You cannot use advanced search with it, um, but you can use pretty much any key term that you can think of um, and get pretty useful results. Um, so you can download Telegram for web, download it off the website and not off the app store because if you get it off the website, um, you get much more robust uh, uh, tools um, than if you download it from the app store, including downloading uh, data history. Because we can't spend too much time on it, and I could literally spend another hour talking about this, I wanted to let you know that Shorenstein Center, uh, the Tech and Social Change Project, we're hosting a Telegram 101 workshop next week that is totally free online over Zoom this time. Um, so just sign up with your professional email because we are vetting participants, um, and you will be able to um, you will be able to really dig into Telegram with us. So sorry for how quick the Telegram intro is. I know that there's a lot of appetite for it. We will spend another hour talking about it. Um, so please come, please join us. It'll be great, it'll be informative. Um, that's Telegram. All right, everybody done taking their photos? Fantastic. And I dropped the links to TG Stat and to that workshop in the Slido. Fantastic, you're still on the ball. That's what I'm you don't even drink coffee. Yeah, that's true. Um, the next stage is mitigation. Um, I love this quote. It's me, I'm not dead. That's Wally himself. <laughs> nope, still here. <laughs> um, and the mitigation is really where the fact checking com comes in um, and where we can try to understand the impact that fact checking has on a specific media manipulation campaign. It's also where we can understand the sheer amount of journalistic resources that are dedicated to debunking false information online, which is vast. And the reason why it's important is both because fact-checking is one of the best tools we have to fight against disinformation, and because newsroom resources are limited. And if they are covering disinformation, it is probably at the expense of covering something else. So if they have to address disinformation campaigns, that is use of public resources or newsroom resources. Frequently we see uh, public agencies or government agencies debunk as well, um, which feeds into the actual literal cost, financial cost of disinformation um, that we have. So in this case, many Canadian news outlets um, covered Wally not being dead. He appeared on many national channels. We also saw it debunked on Twitter. We saw it debunked, debunked by Facebook verified fact checkers. And if you look at, for it on Instagram or on Facebook, you will see the overlay saying this is not, fa uh, not accurate. Um, and for the most part, it was actually pretty successful, which is very rare, very rare because the stage five of the life cycle is the adjustment to new environments. Um, manipulators very rarely stop because they've been fact-checked. Um, in this case, the evidence was so refutable that they moved on to spreading other false information, particularly around Mariupol. This was right as the information about the siege of Mariupol was coming out. And so it was important for Russians to look powerful um, to uh, themselves and to their audiences. Um, and in this case, the adjustment was not continuing to promote this specific false information campaign, but to pivot and promote other false information. Um, this is where we continue monitoring, we continue providing context, um, and we continue looking at these channels. Because as we investigate this, again, we can give our readers, we can give our newsrooms context for here are the here's the false information that these channels have spread already, right? Here is how they have tried to manipulate public opinion already. Here's how they've man tried to manipulate media already. Here's the disinformation they tried to spread. Um, and in many cases, after stage five, uh, for example, something as even as prominent as Stop the Steal, we saw it start all over again. We see new campaigns begin spread on social media. We begin media having to respond to those campaigns. We begin fact checks, uh, uh, having to have fact checks once again, um, uh, debunking false information. 
and that is why it is a media manipulation cycle. It is not, it is not a straight line. Um, very frequently it happens over and over, um, and that is why it is so useful to think about media manipulation in this circular life cycle model. Um, does this sound good while well, the summary slide is up to throw you three questions and take the final few minutes on that? Let's do it. Okay, so um, one of the question was about um, the amplifiers of false and misleading content. So how aware are the amplifiers of the natures of nature of these posts? Do they deliberately spread false info or are they spreading it because they like it or for other reasons? Uh, we see both. Um, many people deliberately spread false information. You know, with these accounts, it was pretty unambiguous. They were pro-Russian accounts. They were spreading pro-Russian disinformation. It's very clear. However, uh, we do also see a targeting of reporters, public officials, um, anybody, influencers, anybody with a large enough reputation online or offline to spread these messages unintentionally. Um, we see Russians try to um, target journalists with fake documents as one example, and we can look at that in the life cycle model as well, right? Um, and uh, many times there is unintentional amplification that is happening just by way social media is structured. Um, so one example is when we quote tweet to debunk something, we're still amplifying the original account. Um, and so we ourselves are becoming amplifiers. Um, we, as we've already talked about, when media chooses to cover something that has not reached wider audiences, we can unintentionally amplify it as well. And so depending on the campaign, you know, especially around COVID, if you remember the early cures, a lot of those were not intentionally deceptive not intentionally uh, amplified by, fault, by uh, bad actors. We have some cases on mediamanipulation.org that look at that as well. Um, so it does not necessarily have to be deliberate for it to be, for you to be part of a media manipulation campaign. Um, so question about non-textual media like short form video. So any tips for monitoring those like TikTok or Reels or something like that? Yeah, that is uh, really tricky. Um, I will once again encourage you to go to mediamanipulation.org where we have outlined some of the ways that you can monitor TikTok. Um, all of those, although it's uh, centered on uh, the war on Ukraine, uh, a lot of those tips will be transferable to other, <coughs> excuse me, other mediums as well. Um, so we, we have all of those resources. And again, use our team as a resource. Um, we know all of this stuff like the back of our hand. We're really meant to be here for reporters to research something you don't have time to research or to walk you through something you don't have time to walk through. Short videos are a pain in the butt. Um, they are very difficult to monitor. Invid can help you with that as well. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but they are really tricky. Thank you. Um, all right, last question is, uh, social media platforms like Facebook do not have advanced search, so what are tips for searching those kinds of platforms if you don't have access to CrowdTangle, for example? Yeah, so um, Facebook is really tricky. Um, its native search proper can be useful to you. Um, I actually took out a slide just because we didn't have time um, looking at the same case. And the reason why it can be useful for you is because if you use the native Facebook search um, and you type in some key terms that you think would appear in a meme, for example, and then you navigate over to the photo por portion or the video portion of that search, you will be able to see memes or screenshots or videos with that text. So you can search for text on Facebook proper. The other one I'll say uh, is you can use Google Advanced Search to use Facebook. So here we do this with Telegram, but if you uh, use site colon facebook.com with your key terms, you can search Facebook pretty well outside of the Facebook ecosystem. This actually also works with fragments of uh, Facebook URLs. One really useful trick is uh, using site colon facebook.com forward slash groups 
and then typing in any key terms for groups that you think might be handy. For example, trucker convoy. And it will show you a list of Facebook groups that are available. So again, Google Advanced Search, really useful tool that we unfortunately just did not have time for. Um, but that is a great way to search uh, Facebook. Instagram is more difficult. Um, Instagram, uh, you can't use these tricks for really, um, and a lot of it is kind of uh, done manually. There are some tools uh, that uh, you can use for that. Um, I'll have mine and Craig's email on uh, after this, so if you want to know more about that, please reach out. Um, we have about two more minutes. Uh, if you have a question that you want to ask, don't forget to ask it. We've got one more question, actually. Yep. Um, so what's the speed ratio between the analysis process by people like you working on this and the spread of fake news? Can you catch up to it? <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, unfortunately, you cannot catch up to it. Um, we look at manipulation campaigns once they have run through the cycle. Although we're monitoring them continuously and we work with news media outlets on their stories um, and on their own uh, investigations, uh, fact checkers, fa uh, Facebook accredited fact checkers um, are much faster at this than we are, um, which is why fact checking is such an important tool that we have. But for us, we look at media manipulation campaigns as they are complete. However, we see all, so please reach out if there's anything that you want more information on. Great, I think that's, uh, that's all the questions and all the time we had time for, but um, the slides are in the Slido and you can also email one of us if you didn't get them and you wanna grab them now, you could take a photo of that now. But thank you everyone for coming. Right on the dot, thank you for coming. And Hope it was you, useful. Jane. Thank you, Jane. Thank you. Wow. Can you believe the timing? Mm -hmm. I'm a genius. <laughs> <laughs>